Father, we want to give you thanks, Lord. Blessed is your holy name. It's so good to unpack a passage which is all about love and community. Help us to learn from this passage. Help us to embrace the truths of this passage. Help us to live them out in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Well, as you know, we're up to part four in the series about love. And part four of the love series is on the topic of anger management. Now, why is that? Because the scriptures actually say, love is not easily angered. Let me read the verse. 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says this, love is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. Um, I, I know that anger can be a positive thing. And we do see that in the Bible sometimes. We think of Jesus' righteous anger. You remember that occasion when um, the mothers were bringing little children to Jesus and uh, his disciples thought, this is out of the question. This is an important prophet. He hasn't got time for you little kids. Get out of here. Get off his sandals. You're crowding him. And Jesus got mad and said, let the little children come to me. Do not try and stop them. You can learn from the kingdom of God from a child. Another occasion, which we probably remember more vividly, was the occasion when uh, Jesus came into the temple courts and he saw that the courts were filled with people bartering, the cooing of doves, the bleating, bleating of sheep. Um, you couldn't buy a perfect lamb without blemish without exchanging your money for the temple currency and they punched up the exchange rate. And when Jesus saw, saw all this noise and all this clutter in the temple courts, which was supposed to be a place of worship for the Gentiles, he was furious. And he actually created a whip out of cords and drove the animals and the people out, including the money changers. Fascinating moment. Yet the anger was righteous because of the way God's house had been turned into a marketplace. Or as actually um, one of the versions puts it, one of the accounts puts it, because there's two different accounts, one of them puts it this way. You've turned my father's house into a den of robbers. Uh, my, my sense is actually there's two separate occasions, the first year of Jesus' ministry and the third year. Some theologians would disagree with me, but I think they are distinct occasions. Well, let's have a look here at the word anger, because we're going to look at it today largely in the negative. Love is not easily angered. Look at the Greek word here. It's uh, paroxeno, paroxeno. And uh, this is the one from the passage, love is not easily angered. And it's generally translated, angered, irritated, greatly distressed. There's another Greek word that we're going to be looking at today as well in many of the passages. And it's this word, orgazo, orgazo. And this word is, uh, means literally to be angry, enraged, to feel and express strong displeasure and hostility. Now, there's many negative versions of anger they're not all the same let me make you give you this little break up this is quite amusing actually four different types of anger of, of the way people express it firstly there's the maniacs the mutes the martyrs and the manipulators four different types one maniacs two the mutes three the martyrs four the manipulators let's look at each one briefly firstly the maniacs Here's a description. The maniacs. The maniacs are the exploders. They yell, they may swear, they throw things when they get upset or frustrated. I remember one day coming back from work, my wife was nursing at the time, and um, she was trying to show a fellow staff member how to fill out the paperwork because the other girl was just not doing it properly. The girl became furious. She grabbed the documents, threw them on the floor and said, well, you just do it yourself then and stormed out. That's the maniac form of anger. You might have one in your workplace. <laughs> um, another version, the mutes. The mutes. The mutes are the silent type. They clam up instead of blow up. They hold it in and hide their true feelings. They simmer and stew. It's been said the problem is when you swallow your anger, your stomach keeps score. Uh, Freud in his the teachings on psychology I think got some stuff very wrong but I do think he taught a great truth if you suppress a feeling it comes out another way you suppress anger it will still come out in some other sort of form and it's certainly not helpful for you I remember actually when Pamela was at uni studying nursing one of her lectures actually said uh, Pamela came home and quoted it to me <laughs> she said 75% um, of people in hospital with a physical condition 
are there because of an emotional or mental cause. The physical condition is actually caused by something emotional or mental. And so we realise, of course, suppressed negative feelings can make you sick. Uh, some psychologists would say that it can even cause cancer and other nasties. I'm not saying cancer is necessarily caused by that, but it can be. Here's another one, the martyrs. The martyrs are the best at holding pity parties. Instead of getting angry, they get depressed. What's wrong with me is their question. As Rick Warren says about the martyrs, the problem is with martyrs, they make everyone else miserable too. Don't invite them to a party, they'll spoil it. <laughs> I remember um, years ago doing some door knocking with a chap called George. We are going door to door and inviting people to an alpha course that we're, we're going to be running in uh, three weeks or so. And we met a lady who expressed her anger that way. Um, and it was a wonderful journey. Like uh, she and her two teenage kids and their cousin all came to faith to Christ in my alpha table and a few others, uh, which was a wonderful journey. And I asked the lady uh, the question early in the alpha course. Um, I said, um, how do you think salvation happens? And she says that it happens when you take the sacraments. And so that's where she says she's orthodox background, but didn't do church, you know. So... She went on quite a journey, but in the journey of all that, one of the things she struggled with was how to deal with anger. Her brother had passed away, very sad, died of cancer. I think personally she was very angry with God about this and angry at the world. Nine months after he'd passed away, she says to us and says to her teenage children, I can't celebrate Christmas. My brother's passed away. Well, not nice for the kids, is it? Next Christmas comes around, she says exactly the same thing. Oh, I can't celebrate Christmas. My brother's passed away. It's how she dealt with her anger. I don't think it's that common, but some people do. They deal with it in that martyrdom form. One more, the manipulators. The manipulators. Let me read about this one. The manipulators, they get mad, they get even. They retaliate in an underhanded way. They use sarcasm and office politics to express their hurt. You know, they want to put the person in their place. They want to get the upper hand. I remember talking with... Um, the senior minister at the time, Mark Connor of uh, City Life, and we were doing lunch together, and he said they'd just done a big survey in their church, and their church is several thousand strong, so it would be a lot of people involved. And he said one of the things that we found with what one of the questions we're asking about what he want preached on, and he said there was a, a lot of people who said, I want stuff that can help me in my workaday environment. And I want to suggest this topic of anger management is definitely a good one to reflect upon and get into your life for the workaday environment. Yeah, you might, you might have a, uh, a manipulator in your workaday environment. Um, I can still remember a, a season when I was in grade eight high school. Gary and I, Mr. Senior, our science teacher, he's a really tall dude with long hair and a big beard. Great guy. I, li I liked him, actually. Anyway, he says to Gary and I, he was doing a special presentation, Lee and Gary, I want you to manage the sound for the presentation. So off we went to the spot. And, uh, and then Gary sits down and he just kind of takes over. And I'm like, he asked both of us to do it, bro. And, and uh, you know, no, no, I've got this, I've got this. And I was getting mad and I thought, well, okay, I'll do the second period. <laughs> Come, comes to the second period. And he's like, no, 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 I've got this. I said, I've got this, you know, I'm doing it. I'm getting madder. There's all sorts of things in a science block, all sorts of bits and pieces. Now, the mute button that he was using, I find a piece of flat glass, about the size of the end of a finger, a little bit bigger, pop it on the mute button, because I'm watching how he's muting it. So he pop it there, he's not looking, pop it there. Three minutes later, zap. Ah! Oh! Had no idea what had happened, I said nothing. Glass in his finger, that's a manipulative form of dealing with anger. Not nice, is it? <laughs> Some of you thinking, oh, I'm not going to mess with Lee. <laughs> I shared that in one of my churches, and um, uh, this girl very high up in Optus Management, she comes to me after the service, oh, that science block story, that was fantastic, I loved it. And I said, no, I didn't mean it was a good thing, that's a bad thing, that's a bad way of dealing with your anger. Ah. <laughs> uh, why do we express anger in negative ways? Well, can I suggest one reason is personality types. Uh, if any, anyone's done personality plus, I, I love that particular one, and they use the old Greek words. 
for four different personalities, sanguine, phlegmatic, melancholy, and choleric. And although the Greeks had no idea where people had those personalities, they thought it had to do with the, the bodily fluids, which of course got nothing to do with it. But I do think they actually got it right with the breakup of personalities. What are these personalities? Well, the sanguine is the emotional extrovert. And uh, they typically are maniacs in how they deal with anger. Or, for instance, the phlegmatic. They, the phlegmatic are, are introvert, and they don't feelings. They have feelings, but they don't have strong feelings. They're typically the mutes. Or you've got the melancholy. Well, the melancholy are, are emotional, but introverts. They are typically the martyrs. And finally, the clerics, they are extrovert, but not very emotional. They are typically the manipulators. And uh, they do break up quite nicely. Now, all, all of these categories, of course, they're not, you know, they're not going to sum everyone up perfectly, of course. But they do give us an idea. They give us a handle on understanding how anger works in our lives. Another reason we express anger in negative ways is because of our parents, our upbringing. We might have had anger manage, management modelled to us very badly. <laughs> <laughs> your parents might have been mutes they got angry with you or got angry with something in the family and they just clam up and they're all quiet and you know something's wrong but you don't know what it is and they just know they're not happy with you but they're not going to talk about it you know and uh and you but you end up doing the same thing when you grow up or you might be the opposite you might end up uh <laughs> you might end up reacting and saying well i'm not going to be like that <laughs> uh, let me tell you a story about Stuart robinson you remember Stuart? He's the founding... Well, they call him the founding pastor of Crossway because he was wet there when they changed the name. But anyway, he was the pastor of Blackburn Baptist slash Crossway for 25 years. Stuart grew up in a family where they were the maniac type. His dad was a maniac. When dad got mad, he would just absolutely fly off the handle, let rip. Stuart, as a teenager, was exactly the same. Stuart remembers as a, as a teenager, he would always, because he grew up in a bit of a rough area in, in, um, in um, Brisbane, and uh, he said he would always pride himself that if he got into a street fight, the other kid would have a lot more blood on his face than what he had. Stuart's exact, exact words. <laughs> Stuart said, then in his latter teenage years, he became a Christian, and he realised you know, there's stuff in the Bible that says I can't do anger the way I'm doing it. This is really wrong. It was not easy in the home. No other Christians and the family used to make fun of him because of his Christianity and ridicule him, especially his father. And one day had a, his father went right off at him and Stuart said he was absolutely fuming, but he didn't fly off the handle. Instead, he suppressed it. And for one year, he did not speak to his father. If you're around the dinner table, everyone's talking. He's, Stuart's talking, but just not to his dad, not responding to anything his dad says. So he'd, he'd done the mute thing. Stuart shared that over the years, with the help of Scripture, with the help of the Holy Spirit, he got better and better at dealing with anger. But certainly our upbringing can influence who we are. How we deal with anger. Well, let's look into the Bible and have a look at five principles to help us. First of all, so anger management, five biblical keys. James 1.19. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Or Proverbs 29.22 says, An angry person stirs up conflict. A hot-tempered person commits many sins. I want to make the suggestion it's important for us to realise that actually anger can lead us to sin. Number one, admit that anger leads to sin. That anger leads to sin. It doesn't always, but it certainly can do. And you see, you might say, well then why don't we just give it up? Well, we don't, we don't like giving it up because actually it can be useful. Plenty of blokes, you know, that might, you know, get a bit macho and assert themselves, you know, uh, get that certain tone in the voice or push the staff around or whatever they want to do, you know, but the idea is, hey, I get my way when I get a bit angry. I'm not giving that up. 
Or it might be um, the lady who uses a manipulative form of anger or just flies off the handle at her husband, it could be, or whoever, and she gets away. She's thinking, well, I'm not giving that up. It's useful. But actually, deep down as Christians, we know, actually, that's not what God wants. That's not what he wants. Yeah, you might get your way out of it, but at what cost? You know? Number two, understand why I get angry. Understand why I get angry. And this isn't easy. You know, um, you know, there might be a particular phrase. When you hear it, you know you've, you've reacted. doesn't matter who says it. But it could be someone used to use that phrase who absolutely hated you at high school. You know what I mean? And you hear that phrase again and you have this reaction. doesn't matter who says it. There's something there in your psyche. Why, why do you particularly under, under, misunderstand people when they talk about a certain topic? And you always seem to, you know, something seems to be going on, you know, and... Well, it could be something from your past. It's just it's there beneath the surface. You're not quite sure why you're reacting the way you do, but you know it's having an impact on you. Many of you have seen the psychologist's iceberg illustration. If you're out on a boat in the northern European seas in winter, you may well see some icebergs. And uh, you'll see one-third of that iceberg above the water, two-thirds underneath. And you see the human can be a little like that. We have a surface part of us. You know, it's the part that everyone knows about. It's the part we know about ourselves. We're all pretty clear on it. But then we've got some stuff beneath the surface that people don't know about us and don't understand. And then you go to the lower third, and there's some stuff down there that we don't even understand. And in the journey of understanding ourselves more, sometimes it is course, personality courses. Sometimes it can be reading a certain book that's going to help. It might look at the very topic of anger. It might look at some other sort of emotional stuff. But as we try and educate ourselves a little bit, it might be a course we do, let's learn to perhaps understand ourselves a little bit more. Proverbs 14.30 says this, A heart at peace gives life to the body but envy rots the bones. Or uh, Proverbs 17.22, a cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Psychologists will tell us that negative, suppressing negative feelings or carrying negative feelings affects your health. But this, this was written 3,000 years ago. It's no surprise to God. The Lord knew that, yes, you carry around things like envy that's mentioned in that passage, whatever it might be, whatever negative feeling, including anger, it's not good for us. It's not good for our health. Ephesians 4.26 says, In your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. And there's a lot in that one. It's a great verse, actually. First of all, it says, In your anger do not sin. Well, um, Paul under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, knew people are going to get angry. It's not like if you get angry, it says in your anger, do not sin. You're going to get angry sometimes. In your anger, though, do not sin. You can get angry and not respond to that feeling of anger doing a negative thing. That, that's the truth. In your anger, do not sin. And then it goes on to say, do not let the sun go down while you're angry. Now, don't misinterpret that meaning that in the heat of a moment when you're furious with someone, you deal with it straight away. That can sometimes be the worst time to deal with it. When you're furious because it's just happened, you need to simmer down. But it is saying deal with it quickly. Deal with it promptly. And why should we deal with it promptly? Well, remember what the scripture said about the devil getting a foothold? It seems to me that if we don't try and deal with our anger fairly quickly... Satan can manipulate us because of that anger we're carrying around. So the point number three, be quick to deal with anger. Be quick to deal with anger. Number four, don't aggressively retaliate. Don't aggressively retaliate, which especially for the maniacs is the most natural thing in the world. Proverbs 29, 11, a fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. You see, it's not a clever thing to give full vent to your anger. God's telling us there that it's a foolish thing to do. Secondly, we're told in Romans twelve seventeen, do not repay anyone evil for evil. So that's the thing, isn't it? You know, someone does something nasty to us and we, have, we immediately want to respond in the same way. Very, very natural for human nature to be like that, of course. But actually, 
The New Testament saying, don't repay evil for evil. You know, um, we, we said in the last point, um, find an appropriate time to deal with it when you're relaxed and not in the heat of the moment. And I want to suggest that the marriage is a classic um, example of that. You know, um, there are going to be times in your marriage where you're going to have something to share with your partner that might not be easy. You know they're not going to like to hear it, but you feel you've got to talk about it. Now, don't do that late at night when you're both tired and grumpy. You know, that's the worst time to bring it up. You know, you're, you're almost setting yourself up for this is going to be a really big blue, as we Australians call it. And there's a couple of other times I'd just be cautious about. And, you know, if you're just right before the meal time when you normally eat, wouldn't it be better to do it after dinner? You know, <laughs> just don't bring it up then. Or another example could be, you know that your wife or your husband's due for a coffee about now. <laughs> <laughs> Wait till after they've had their coffee. <laughs> just, just be mindful about when you bring things up. I, I want to be frank. A lot of marriages fall apart because of other healthy ways of dealing with anger. That's just the honest truth. A lot of marriages fall apart because of unhealthy ways of dealing with anger. And um, Pamela and I, we have had some very unhealthy ways of dealing with anger. Now, we're, we both... We both have a lot of sanguine in our personality, so we lean towards the maniac, both of us. Uh, our personality, I'm, I'm a uh, mostly sanguine with um, a very similar amount of choleric, so almost even. Uh, so they're, they're really high and very, virtually nothing of the others, all those two. Pamela's um, mostly sanguine with a secondary choleric, so we're almost the same personality. She's just got less choleric, so we are very similar. And consequently, you know, we got a, you, you, we're both mad about something, you can guarantee the feathers are going to fly, right? <laughs> so, you know, we raise our voice and we get very articulative, uh, articulate and, you know, loud voices, articulate words, very damaging, cruel words sometimes. And it's not good. It's not good. It's very damaging for the relationship. And we both know it. And yet, from time to time, we still do it. We don't do it as much as we used to, but we still do it. And one of the things that I will say, though, by the grace of God that we're good at, and it, is, it does lean the sanguines tend to be better at this, is we get over it quickly. So we're pretty quick to apologise. One of us will own up that it was all, all, all me, you know, it was, you know, I shouldn't have said that or shouldn't have done that or whatever, and just completely apologise. And we spend some time together talking through it and trying to build up those love credits again, saying, saying and doing a lot of nice things to our partner to re-establish that feeling of love again. Um, but friends, the reality is learning how to deal with anger, no matter what your tendency and style, is going to be very important for relationships and, of course, especially the most important relationships in your life. One more. Number five, learn to diffuse anger. Learn to diffuse anger. Now, by the way, if anyone wants a copy of the notes, um, there's, there's always some around. And, of course, there are those studies that relate to these, um, these very messages as well available. First of all, attitude. The attitude you carry can help diffuse anger. Proverbs 15, 18. A hot-tempered person stirs up conflict, but the one who is patient calms a quarrel. Remember we learnt that love is patient? Patience, that, that kind of calm patience can calm a quarrel. Another one, words. Proverbs 15, 1 and 4, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Or the soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. Our words can make a big difference, what we say and how we say it. Another one, actions. Luke 6, 27. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do, notice that, do good to those who hate you. That's not easy. Do good to those who hate you. That's not a normal human tendency, is it? It's very New Testament, but it's not the natural way we're wired. Um, Pammy and I, when um, we uh, bought our first house in Sydney, and it was, um, we had some people move in shortly after we bought the house, and they were an elderly couple, both retired, and they were really frustrating. We've mostly had good neighbours. They were not. They would grumble and complain about everything. 
uh, they themselves, I think, carried a lot of anger, and they certainly made us angry. Uh, we, we had friends uh, who were interstate and were wanting to move to Sydney, and they were, you know, needed to find somewhere. They came up in their caravan, and so they parked it in our driveway. Well, the neighbours complained to the council, not to us, they just went straight to the council and said, you know, complained about the caravan. So we get this document saying the caravan must be removed immediately, it is blocking the neighbours' view. Anyway, um, these guys were really annoying. But one day we're out at the shops and uh, Pamela spotted um, <clears throat> this um, documentary on jazz, um, hours, hours of it. And we knew the old boy loved his jazz. He's always had his jazz cranked up playing it. And we thought, Pamela said, why don't we buy him that, that and make it a gift? So we did. It's pretty expensive too. Packaged it up really nicely took it over and said, hey, we saw this in the shops, thinking of you, we know you love your jazz, and gave it to him and he opened it up and he, whew, his eyes lit up. He thought it was marvellous. He thought it was absolutely marvellous. And he's playing the thing all the time. And a um, um, couple of times he said, oh, are you sure I can't give you some money towards that? And I said, no, no, it's a gift. It's a gift, mate. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Well, he was never angry with us again. <laughs> Seriously, he wasn't. Totally changed his attitude. And even his wife, she was not very angry anymore either. Um, sometimes... What the Bible says works. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? Sometimes we read a scripture and think, oh, it's not going to work. And, and, but actually, it does. And do good to your enemies. They felt like flipping enemies. They really did. Do good to your enemies. One more. Prayer. Luke 6.28. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who ill treat you. Wow. Imagine praying a blessing on someone who's done something really nasty to you. Not easy, is it? Not easy. My natural tendency is to pray that God will sort them out. You know, It's not necessarily wrong. We want to pray for people's development. But isn't that interesting? It tells us to pray a blessing over them. Pray a blessing over them. And I want to suggest that it probably does something to our hearts when we do that, when we're praying positive things over that absolute nutcase. But yeah, you, you realise, no, no, I need to pray positive stuff over their life. And I think it even affects the heavenly realm. Because let's just be honest, Satan wants us all to be at each other with anger all the time. He'd love that. So we know that if we can create peace in the heavenly realm, it can affect us in our relationships here on earth. Let's recap those practical points. Number one, admit that my anger can lead to sin. Number two, understand why I get angry. Number three, be quick to deal with anger. Four, don't aggressively retaliate. Five, learn to diffuse anger. And four different ways to do that. Attitude, words, actions, and prayer. Let me just go through them again. Number one, admit that uh, my anger can lead to sin. Two, understand why I get angry. Three, be quick to deal with anger. Four, don't aggressively retaliate. Five, learn to diffuse anger with your attitudes, words, actions, and prayer. Let me finish today with a final story which illustrates that these scriptures are not just kind of practical psychological suggestions I want to suggest that they've got power and it's amazing how people in a circumstance where they'd have every reason to be absolutely fuming with it, rage and yet through the powerful word of God and his spirit all of that can be turned around I want to tell you the story uh, about Keith Stewart if you've watched the journeys course you might remember it Keith uh, had a little corner store in New Zealand and um, one day at the corner store his little six-year-old wanted to come with him to deliver groceries it just wasn't convenient at that time he said no you need to go home be with mum you know so off she went but she didn't go home she went and hung out at the local school anyway so dinner time came around they realized she wasn't there and they thought yeah you know she's in a little moment of defiance you know didn't get my way um anyway uh Dinner's finished, he's still not home. They thought, oh, okay, we can have to call around all the friends, find out where she is. So they called around, couldn't, couldn't find out where she was. Suddenly they panicked and thought, oh, oh goodness, okay, this could, be, this could be serious. Called the police. Police uh, mounted a search and eventually when they brought in the dogs, the sniffer dogs, they found her body under the floorboards of the school. She'd been murdered. 
Didn't take too long and they caught up with the culprit. He was a 13-year-old lad who had raped and murdered this little six-year-old girl. He used to go, go to their shop. Keith knew who he was. Now, Keith's natural tendency, I'm going to go get a gun and kill that little sucker. Hideous child. He's killed and raped my little girl. I'm going to deal with this myself. But Keith read the scriptures about all of his feelings. He prayed, asked the Holy Spirit to help him. And instead, he went around to the parent's house. He knocked at the door and the mother of that teenager didn't want to let him in because, I mean, she obviously expected him to be in an absolute rage about what their son had done. He said to her, look, I'm, I'm not here in anger. I'm here to share my grief. Anyway, reluctantly, she let him in. And he came over and he sat in the lounge with the father of that lad. The father was in an absolute state. He was so ashamed of what his son had done. He's a broken man. In fact, uh, Keith said, if I hadn't have spent that bit of time with him and talked about my grief, I'm sure he would have committed suicide. Well, many years later, when that teenager had... Obviously, he was too young to go to prison. He went to a kind of a delinquent rehabilitation centre. And over, he served his time, several years. And when he was let out, Keith wanted to meet with him. And so he did. They talked. And again, Keith said, I don't actually harbour any anger towards you. And Keith goes on and shares in his story that he didn't grow up in a home with a mum and dad. Keith actually grew up in an institution. But in that institution, as an angry young kid, feeling abandoned by his parents and all of that stuff you go through when you're in that awful scenario, he was filled with anger and rage. And he said, some of the people at that centre, they knew Jesus. They introduced me to Jesus carefully and prayerfully and I accepted him as my Lord and Saviour and I knew that he had forgiven all of my anger and hate and all the things that I carried around I knew he'd wiped it all away and the only reason I could forgive that young man was because of Jesus' work in my heart but what it reminds us friends is my goodness if God can work in a man's heart like that when he's got every reason to be filled with absolute rage it reminds us my goodness surely he can supernaturally work in our lives when we're dealing probably generally with something far more minor let me read ephesians 4 31 it says get rid of all bitterness rage anger brawling slander along with every form of malice be kind and compassionate to one another forgiving each other just as christ forgave you. And just to highlight that verse we've been focusing on today, 1 Corinthians 13, 5, love is not easily angered. Love is not easily angered. I'm going to invite Roxanne to close in prayer for us. Father God, we just thank you for the message today and we pray, Lord, that as it speaks to our hearts, may your Holy Spirit... Come and fill each one of us. May your spirit lead us and guide us and reveal to us what we need to do, Lord, to deal with these things that are in our lives that keep us from, from being the person that you want us to be. And Father, I just pray for your spirit to speak to each one of us that we can look through these scriptures again and to learn, Lord, how you want us to be the very best versions of ourselves. And we thank you, Lord, for the teaching today. And we pray, Lord, that our hearts are open to your word in Jesus' name.